This is not old stuff. Let's get sober. There is but one church in the world who are at present time standing in the breach and making up the hedge, building up the old waste places. And for any man to call the attention of the world and other churches to this church denouncing her as Babylon is to do the work in harmony with him who is the accuser of the brethren. The whole world is filled with hatred of those who proclaim the binding claims of the law of God. And the church who are loyal to Jehovah must engage in no ordinary conflict. Those who have any realization of what this warfare means will not turn their weapons against the church militant, but with all their power will wrestle with the people of God against the confederacy of evil. That's our job. Those who start up to proclaim a message on their own individual responsibility who while claiming to be taught and led of God still make it their special work to tear down that which God has been building since all these years are not doing the will of God, but be it known that these men are on the side of the great deceiver. Believe them not. Is there still such a voice? Is there such a church? Well, this book was handed out or given out by the General Conference in 1952. Pacific Press Publishing Association. Principles of Life from the Word of God. In actual fact, it was more or less like a fundamental belief document. And this is what the church believed in 1952. And I stand by every word. I'm not going to read you what it says, but it had pictures in it which tell what they believed, and I'll show you some of the pictures. God's eternal Ten Commandments have been tampered with by the fires of heaven. My covenant will I not break nor alter the things which have gone out of my mouth. An enemy has done this. Here's another one in that book. The forces of error have endeavored to hold sway by the use of dungeon and the sword and the stake and the prison. Truth needs no such support. Human effort, clothes, clothiers. The only acceptable garment at that marriage supper is the faith and the righteousness of Christ. Faith in the righteousness of Christ. Law of types and ceremonies has been nailed to the cross. Catholics say the tiara of the Pope of Rome is the symbol of his power and authority. They weren't afraid to say who was who. They weren't afraid. The lamb-like qualities of the two-horned beast will disappear in hate and bloodshed. Religious and civil liberty. Tragic transformation into a terrible beast. Speaking like a dragon. Churches that have left the word of God and taken man's tradition becomes corrupt. I wish my church would still preach like this. Full of doleful creatures. Read Revelation 18.2. Idolatry of the mass. Papal infallibility. Communion of the dead. Confession to a man. Image worship. Immaculate conception of Mary. Tradition above the Bible. Man is by nature immortal. The teaching of natural immortality does away with Christ's redemption for lost man. I am so proud of this book. God calls upon the church to give his message to the world that faces the judgment. Loud voice. Three angels' messages. Stop. Are we faithful to our God-given trust? Third angel's message. The world is on the brink of a catastrophe. Satanic effort to break the chain, the Bible and prophecy. Every link will hold. God's line of prophecy marks the way through the kingdom without error. And it tells us about the prophetic charts. The world must pause and decide at this parting point of ways. Either Sunday or Sabbath. And they make no uncertain pictures here. Who's this pointing the way of the Sunday? And what is this one holding, pointing the other way? The Bible. And I like this one too. Sunday, in honor of Christ's resurrection, this man looks really angry. When the seventh day Sabbath, and they align it with Cain and Abel. This was 1952. No man can go in two directions, evil desires, full obedience. Where are these teachings? 
This is an official document from the General Conference, 1952. So yet again, I've been talking about this a lot recently. We see the conflation of the term church without distinction that permeates Adventism. And as you can see, that's coming downstream from their prophetess who made the same blunder. But also, no, you guys aren't the one church standing in the breach. Your movement was started by anti-Trinitarian heretics coming out of a fanatic movement led by a false prophet. Have your own false prophet and teach a false gospel. You guys are a part of the great apostasy, the great falling away from the true Christ and his gospel. And notice he cited from Ellen White's Faith I Live By, yet I constantly have SDAs that will try and chastise me for citing from the same book saying, that's not part of the conflict of the ages or Christ object lessons, bro. SDA teachers and, and pastors don't use her writings like you. You don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. Just like we saw when we responded to Stephen Bohr a few months back. He's citing from manuscript releases, confrontation, all over the gamut of her writings. Yet when I do it, because I'm not doing it to bolster her, I'm somehow in the wrong. I'm confused. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know how her writings work. Oh, okay. <laughs> she didn't make that distinction like many of these modern day SDAs want to try and whittle it down to. Thinking that helps them. I'll stick with that. Let's stick with Desire of Ages and Great Controversy and Patriarchs and Prophets, okay? The ones that were barricaded by a thus saith the Lord. I can show you all the problems from those three books. And by all the problems, I mean the, the, the damnable her heresies. She claims she never wrote a sentence of heresy. All of her writings are the lesser light. The Holy Spirit authored all of them, just like he did the Bible, supposedly. To go against her writings, not just the Conflict of the Ages series, was to go against the Spirit of God, and so on. But more importantly, accuser of the brethren, dude, that's you guys. You guys are definitionally accusers of the brethren. The irony, you guys slander and misrepresent Christians constantly. You've done so in this talk repeatedly. It's hard-coded into your guys' system of theology. In the same quote, she claims, we're on the side of the great deceiver. No, we aren't. That's a lie and bearing false witness. But you guys are the commandment keepers? And no, the whole world is not filled with hatred for those who proclaim the binding claims of the law of God. What a silly claim. And those of us that have a problem with this, at least classical Protestants, again, take issue with your unlawful use of the law. Not the law of God, not obedience, your guys' unlawful use and wielding of the law. Our confessions have entire chapters on the law of God, yet you guys continue to misrepresent us by using the fallacy of false dilemma. That if people disagree with you, it means they hate the law of God. Classical Protestant liturgy contains both law and gospel because the law is a part of scripture and Paul says all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, teaching, correction, etc., we are against your guys' bad handling of the law, making it a reconciliation device. When no, that's what the gospel is. The gospel's not the law. But because you guys don't understand that distinction and think the law is the gospel, you guys can't wrap your head around this. Again, more of this in Monday's video. Also, we're not part of an evil confederacy of Satan in a militant church effort to form some type of war against you guys. This is slander. This is misrepresentation. And you guys need to stop with the fear mongering. This sort of stuff only further ingrains lies within Adventists, making them fearful of everyone else. This is cult-like tactics to keep people locked into the deception. Adventists, classical Protestantism is nothing like this guy's portraying or the movement portrays. You don't need to fear people irrationally. We don't hate God's law. We don't hate Adventists. We don't hate anyone for that matter. We believe hatred is a sin. In terms of hating your neighbor, that's murder in your heart. We're normal, everyday people who love Christ in the gospel and want the world to come to know him as Lord. Nothing about hating God's law, advocating for anarchy, it's funny, on the one hand, 
They'll, they'll say this sort of nonsense about us advocating for anarchy and total lawlessness. Yet at the same time, I have SDAs that tell me the Christian nationalism of some Protestant circles evidences that the Sunday law is on the horizon and Protestants want to enact God's law at the governmental level, imposing Sunday sacredness as the law of the land, forcing Adventists to observe Sunday. Which one is it, folks? Again, the constant catch-22. Then he mentions, oh goodness, the book of, uh, of principles of life and the illustrations found within it. Walter, this shows you guys know nothing about classical Protestantism. That's probably why they quit publishing that book, because it's embarrassing. In that book, they blanketed all Christians with the beliefs of the fruit of 20th century American revivalist style theology. Yet that has nothing to do with all of us. But because they went to church on Sunday and believe in the, the na same nature of the soul concept, that somehow connects all of us? Classical Protestants do not believe what that book claims but the law of God. And it's because of propaganda like, like that that SDAs still parrot these claims. I hear it all the time. They'll parrot the stuff of me. It's like, dude, that has no application to me. Do you not understand? Can, can, do your ears not work? Can, do you actually listen to what people actually say? Can, can you actually engage with what I'm saying? Not just parrot a script. Learn to engage with what people are saying. Don't just parrot fear-mongering, great controversy worldview propaganda. And no, you guys are wrong. No law was nailed to the cross. That isn't what Colossians 2 is talking about. And the people that say the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross are just as wrong as you guys. We've talked about this before and have an article about it on our website. That's not what's in focus. The sin debt of believers was nailed to the cross. The word used is kerographon. It's a hopox legomena. It's the only place that that's used in scripture. And it literally means a handwritten record of legal indebtedness, not ceremonial laws. You guys read the King James and think handwriting of ordinances, which is how Kerographon is translated in the King, King James, you think that means ceremonial laws. When no, Paul's point is the sin debt of believers was nailed to the cross, which completely refutes your guys' investigative judgment. By virtue of Jesus bearing the sins of his people in his body on the cross, and he was nailed to the cross, paying the debt in full. And it's because of that that believers are not bound to the types and shadows of the ceremonial laws, which is why he says, so let no one judge you in food, drink, etc. Because that all pointed to Jesus. And no, as we looked at earlier, the Christian belief about the nature of the soul and the intermediate state does not diminish Christ's work of redemption for lost man. What a ridiculous and silly claim. And no, it isn't just natural immortality. Only God has that. Eternal life is knowing the true God, being united to him by faith, not simply indefinite existence. But you're so proud of this book and wish your church would still preach misrepresentation and bearing false witness about Christians? Commandment-keeping church, folks. He said every link of SDA Bible prophecy will hold. Dude, your guys' end times chronology is one of the weakest and worst parts of your system. There's no decree by a Persian king in Ezra 7, or Ezra, the whole book for that matter, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, which foils your entire system. Your entire chronological timeline hinges on that. 1844 is one of the flimsiest, weakest teachings in your movement. But that's the anchor chain that is a firm foundation? My goodness, man. My goodness. He says, I like this one. Sunday is honor of Christ's resurrection. We've gone over this before, folks. Like I said, we're going to be getting into this deep again in a few weeks. They have no clue what that even means and why that's pointed to. They have no theology around new creation, which was inaugurated by Christ resurrecting, while which accomplished redemption and, and Jesus then entering his rest after that completed work. God in creation created, accomplished that mighty work, and then entered his rest the seventh day. God in Christ paralleled that work in the redemption of that creation that fell, accomplishing that mighty work. 
and then entered his rest on the first day, not the seventh. Hence why the memorial of the new creation is the first day, not the seventh. But all they can do is, well, you think the law was nailed to the cross. <laughs> oh, but we have no biblical basis for it. I mean, did you notice the first piece that he pointed to? It said they're the ones holding up the Bible for their belief and everyone else is pointing to the Pope and the world. Then literally in the next picture, side by side, he says we're pointing to the resurrection, which is scripture. Adventists really need to stop lying about this and say they disagree with Christians' interpretation. Not that they have no biblical basis, not that it's because of the Pope. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with new creation. Even in that image where the guy had the flag and was saying Seventh day Sabbath because of creation, they say because of the resurrection. Yeah, because the resurrection was the inauguration of the new creation. It's still creation, dude. You guys are stuck in the old. Everything is old. It's back to Sinai, back to Eden, the old covenant, the old memorial, the seventh day. It's always back, 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 going back. You don't understand what you're criticizing, and it's embarrassing. And any of us that do understand this, it's just laughable. You, you guys don't understand that when we say the resurrection, that's a summation statement. That's not telling you the mechanics of why. It's because the resurrection inaugurated a new creation. We're in the new creation now. 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus redeemed the creation that fell. The seventh day pointed to that. That's what Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 is actually talking about. You guys disagree with our interpretation. That's fine. Don't care. But stop lying and saying that we don't use scripture. 